All right, folks, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode with our German correspondent, Noah Rettberg, on the intimate relationship between modern industrial Germany and its truly sovereign energy source, lignite coal. I learned a lot of great things in this episode. Lignite not only powered much of German industrialization, but there are some other very novel uses. It's used to create sin fuel, but even more surprising to me, Lignite turned into margarine for human consumption. Anyway, for this and more, stay tuned. This is a fun episode, guys. Enjoy. Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by a returning guest, Noah Retberg. Um, and we are going to be talking about the protests that are sort of seizing public attention right now at the Luzerath Lignite Mine. And I think moving on to explore um, some of the socioeconomic, cultural um, background in terms of the German relationship with coal and, and more specifically lignite. So, you know, hang on to your f- hats, folks. This is going to be interesting. Just as a brief intro, Noah has introduced himself many times on this podcast before. Um, but in brief, uh, as of our last interview a couple months ago, a physics laboratory technician in training and a diehard member of Nuclearia fighting for the reopening of the three closed nuclear plants and uh, the imminent shutdown in April of the remaining three German nuclear plants. So Noah, a warm welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, May I by now uh, write Chris Kiefer's personal go-to German on my resume? (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. (laughs) You do a good job, man. Your English is excellent um, and you seem to be quite, uh, quite well informed. So, Noah, um, we just saw on Twitter today, Mark Nelson um, and a bunch of others have posted this rather humorous video of German police officers bogged down in some very um, viscous mud, um, sort of being taunted by climate protesters and sort of pushed over in the mud um, at, I believe this is the Lutzerath lignite mine. Um, So, or Lutzerath is maybe the village about to be torn down and in any case you know better than me tell me what's we'll start again with a kind of present day story and we're going to drift into the context but catch us up on uh, on the latest news um from mortar so uh the mine is actually called Garzweiler. um lützerath is just a very little and in, in, i mean really a very little uh village which is in the way of the expansion of this um Garzweiler mine and there are there were planned um, several ways of extending this uh, these mine. It's enormous. Um, and basically, they went for the smallest possible extension that they think they needed. And this extension necessitates um, tearing down the little village of Lützerath. But which what this also means is that um, there is a lot of uh, surface of a lot of area which they planned to tear down and also mine which isn't going to be torn down and mined. So uh, a lot of news about this very, very little village that is going to be turned, torn down. But there are like real towns that um, have gotten saved because it was decided against uh, uh, tearing them down. I mean, I think as early, as late as uh, 2017, the red-green government of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia uh, planned to use lignite coal until 20, 2045. So um, this would have necessitated um, tearing down uh, significantly more towns and villages, um, mining three times more coal than the extension that is currently planned for. Um, so they, they are doing a comparatively mild extension of the Garzweiler mine. I, I think I saw some footage of uh, Minister Habeck um, really emphasizing that this was a, you know, a concession, essentially, that, uh, you know, more destruction had been avoided and that this was sort of the painful price Germany had to pay for, for the energy crisis it's under right now. But he must be in a, he must be in a tough and tough predicament being a kind of green member and, and cabinet minister. I'm, I'm certainly um, not someone that is on the side of Robert Habeck regularly, but he is right um, in this point that it was planned to um, um, mine uh, three times more area, tear up three times more area and um, evict uh, several towns which are orders of magnitude larger than uh, tiny Lützerath. 
So in, in this point, he's actually quite right. And um, also one thing that he is right about is um, that the coal they are mining um, in, in, this, in this mine right now um, will basically be extracted by 2030. There, this is not... Um, um, so many Greens in Germany think this is like uh, the Greens betraying their promise to phase out coal by 2030. But I would be surprised if the coal that they are current that they will be digging up with this extension will be still there in 2030. The um, the Darzweiler mine, as it currently is, has probably around um, 100 million tons of coal left, and with this extension, they will get another 280 million tons of coal, and um, going above 270 million tons necessitates. Um, ripping out this little village, uh, Lützerath. And this, this little village of Lützerath has gotten such a symbolic character, which just doesn't even merit. There are like a couple of houses there. So, um, and it's, it's kind of existing on this, this like peninsula, like sticking out into the mine. I, I don't know if you can take a moment. Like we've, we've covered it before. Jesse Freeston went on the, uh, the Thiesbecker tour, um, you know, with some shots of uh, of a park, I think that overlooks the mine. But for those of our viewers and listeners that don't have a, a good conception of this, I mean, there were some uh, very st stark images of, I believe it's the Dragar um, coal extracting machines, the world's largest land vehicle, if, unless I'm wrong on that. Um, you know, excavating with a police line in front and protesters, you know, very dramatic lighting. You know, I think some of these images and just the symbolism of it all is, is electrifying. But for those who haven't seen the images or don't know a lot about the mines, like these are some of the biggest holes in the ground in Europe, from what I understand. Yes, they, they, they go like, um, like 400, uh, 500 meters deep. And um, going this deep necessitates being this big. There is a limit um, how steep the bank of the mine can be. And there is a limit how much um, room the excavators in there need to maneuver in order to be um, in order to be uh, economical. So um, proposals were made by um, DEV, which is like supposedly an institute, but it's basically if imagine if uh, Marty Jacobson were an institute and were German, um, and they they made like this little study where they talked about um, how that. Uh, they don't need to go um, farther out and just need to go deeper because when they go deeper, there's more, more coal deep down. Um, but they can't because, if they, um, they, as I said, there's a limit to how steep the bank of, of the mine can be. And going deeper um, would necessitate um, going larger, even so. And uh, also it would um, it remove area to maneuver inside and it would put further constraints regarding pumping out groundwater there. So um, they made like a lot of fuss about saving just this little village because it has been become such a symbolic issue just to save this unimportant village. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to call it unimportant um, for like the people that used to live there some time ago, but in, in the whole context of... Uh, um, if you compare it to the people that will die from this, the uh, the fumes, or that will receive the electricity that they need, or that will suffer from the climate change that it will cause, but just the village is not important. But they made a point out of saving just this village. Okay, and just describe briefly what the protests have been looking like. So um, this this little village has been legally occupied by some radical protesters quite um, a while ago. Um, so, and they, they dug in there, they, they prepared like for effectively a siege. Um, they dug, uh, tunnels so that they could get in and out of uh, the village, even if it was surrounded by police. Wow. Yes. So, um, when, when RWE, which is the owner of the mine and the power plants, disconnected the electricity to this village because nobody was living there legally. Uh, they built their small uh, solar power plant in November. Um, probably the least EROI any power plant ever had. A bunch of solar panels running for two months in the darkest parts of German winter. 0 0.1 and probably 10,000 gram CO2 um, per kilowatt hour. Like ridiculous B building. And it now lies uh, trampled and demolished on the floor to never be used again. 
like actually burning diesel in a diesel gens that would probably be better than using the solar panels for just two months in the middle of winter. But they they tried to to build a holdout there. Um, um, they built uh, roadblocks, um, dark trenches. So they prepared this basically like a little siege and um, tried to hold out there. And also um, probably a lot of more moderated protesters came and uh, tried to hinder the police um, of clearing this village by just um, keeping them occupied, protesting outside of the village. Um, a lot of um, famous German celebrities arrived and voiced their opposition to the coal mining and supported the protesters there. Um, but um, the police did their job. They cleared out the village um, several days ago. They had more problems clearing out the um, tunnels that uh, were dug under the village. So um, I think uh, they finished that two days ago, but now even the tunnels are cleared out. So there are people there are people hiding in the tunnels as well, is that correct? There were people hiding longer in the tunnels than um, in the village itself. Wow. So the police um, cleared the village uh, before they cleared the tunnels. How, how Just if you know, how elaborate are the tunnels? Because, uh, you know, tunnels can be super dangerous. Um, given of the pictures that I have seen there, um, probably not very technology advanced, I would have not gone in there. Um, probably um, those people building them would have, uh, have seriously endangered themselves and the police that came there to clear them out. Especially since it has been raining a shitload for the last month. And German soil is like really fucking red right now and barely can hold itself together, which has been a problem for those tunnels, but also because at the edge of those mines, a lot of people have been protesting, not just those illegally occupying the village, was a lot of protesters that went right to the edge of uh, of the mine, um, which in general, but especially in times like this, where it is so wet, is in danger of collapsing. So those people um, were in danger of falling into the, the 40, 50, 60 uh, meter at the, at the first part, uh, deep pit. So. Right. Iconic images, though. So again, I mentioned a tweet from... Mark Nelson, he was saying that I think in 2022, the equivalent of 37 terawatt hours of, of energy came out of uh, this specific lignite mine. And Germany, of course, is uh, closing the remainder of its its you know world class nuclear fleet, which represents about 30 terawatt hours. Is the the coal to nuclear comparison um, a useful one? I mean, does it fulfill a similar role on the German grid? So. Both lignite coal and nuclear uh, were used in load following mode in Germany, but um, load coal was used um, to load follow significantly more severe. So coal was used more as the dirty partner of renewables, and nuclear was more used as the um, as the stable um, foundation of of the grid um, that only um, throttled down in times of severe um, renewable overproduction. So since, uh, since nuclear is, uh, is the cheapest source of firm power in Germany, nuclear will be the last one to throttle down if we have too much renewables on the German grid. Um, so um, coal, of course, does a lot of more load following, especially since um, not the fuel, but the CO2 certificates are really expensive. So in times of high wind production, they will um, shut down the, the coal plants, like coal shut down the plants or throttle them, them down. Also, the, the coal fleet has, of course, a lot more installed capacity than the nuclear fleet, even though that um, the nuclear fleet made comparable amounts of um, electricity, 66 terawatt hours to around 100 for lignite. Um, the lignite fleet has probably, I think, around 23 gigawatts, while the nuclear fleet in 2021 had 8.2 gigawatts. Now that the nuclear is gone, of course, something has to um, replace uh, the nuclear. And this will be, for now, just coal in the future, a combination of coal and renewables. But for now, just... So I guess two things. Um, there's there's the, the planned shutdown of the remainder of the German fleet, which I guess ran on its usual fuel, ro- fuel rods, probably at slightly lower capacity for the last three or four months. Is it, like there's now, you know, we've had a very mild winter from what I understand. Um, the gas reserves are looking in good shape. The prices are way down. 
Um, do you think this is the perfect storm? I think a lot of people were hoping that, you know, the energy crisis would bring Germany to its senses. Do you think there's going to be a sort of lull and a, and a kind of false hope that the energy crisis is over, um, which will lead to the very stupid decision of, of closing those remaining plants? Or is there a chance for common sense to prevail? I know there's a big demonstration coming up, um, I believe, in Berlin in the not too distant future. Uh, pro-nuclear demonstration, but just tell me a little bit about that context before we we head into the the historical relationship of of Germany with with lignite and coal. So um, last half of November, first half of December was like really cold, basically no wind for don't don't get flouted for four months, um, and during that time it looked really bad. Um, we rapidly lost inventory in our gas storage, going from almost full to 80 in just a couple of weeks. Um, electricity and gas prices were high. Um, uh, carbon emissions uh, were high, basically. Uh, the coal fleet was basically running bolts out 30 gigawatts all the time. Um, and then in the second half of December, it got warm. It got like, really warm. Um, we have ha We are having... Uh, double, de double degree digits um, um, last month, last four weeks, and also a lot of wind. So this is, was the saving grace uh, for for our energy policy because as, the, as we got like really high amounts of wind and gas consumption plummeted as as temperature rose, um, so did uh, the situation on the grid and on the gas market uh, relax. Um, yeah, and so the the um, Mr. Harvard's plan. Let's let's hope for a nice winter. Um, so far, I think it's it's been looking um, really good. This combined um, with uh, reduction in, in in production, also many um, private consumers having reduced um, their consumption of gas, has so far relaxed um, the energy scarcity in Europe. It's it's not like it's gas and um, gasoline and diesel is cheap again, but um, the situation has been improving, and uh, no, we we um, we didn't get the worst. So yes, so far I think it has been looking uh, really good. Will this lead to more unsustainable energy choices being made? I think yes, because if the situation would have stayed as worse as it was in the beginning of December. Um, this would have put a lot more pressure on the German government to save uh, those nuclear plants and a lot more people um, in business and politics in Germany and other countries would have looked more to nuclear energy, especially now that the France have somewhat gotten their shit together. So, yes, I, th I think one can say that uh, German energy policy, green energy policy got saved by a mild winter. I, I mean, I guess the reason I brought it up is because, um, I mean, it was really kind of um, the decision to run the plants was made, I think, out of real fear from the stress tests that their closure could result, you know, with unfavorable weather conditions in potential, you know, blackouts and real damage to the economy. So I'm just worried now that, you know, with this uh, easy winter, um, that lack of urgency is is going to lead the German you know, political apparatus to make the bad decision of shutting down the fleet. But that's probably self-evident and obvious. And I wanted to spend the remainder of the time we have together um, just understanding a little bit more about the the history of, of coal in Germany. You were sharing with me a song, um, a song of the coal miners, I believe. And there's a whole culture around it. I mean, this was the fossil fuel, I think, that underpinned German industrialization. And, you know, you guys don't have much in the way of petroleum or gas resources, as I understand. So Let's let's chat a little bit about the the historical German relationship with coal. So, coal is basically, if you accept, with, with an exception of peat, but I think we don't take peat really serious as a fossil fuel in general. But coal was kind of the first real fossil fuel that we used um, when we industrialized, and many people see the beginning of the industrial revolution not um, in the late 18th century when the first real working steam engines appeared, but rather in the beginning of the 17th or even 16th century, when we started mining coal. And right around that time, also um, coal mining in Germany started. So um, in, I think in the, in the discussions about uh, the importance of coal, 
Um, in the Anglosphere, um, there is a lot of forests on inland. How like coal overtook wood in, in the 17th century in England as a primary source of energy, and how that allowed England an economic growth that it would not have seen if it stayed at wood. And similar things happened in Germany, but slightly delayed. Keep in mind, Germany was uh, the hosting ground for the Thirty Years' War. We lost like um, a third to a half of our population in the 17th century. So um, a lot of places of Germany suffered from severe underpopulation and not a scarcity of energy. The scarcity of humans, not a scarcity of energy. Um, my home, Northern Hesher, had like lost 70% of its native population during the Thirty Years' War. And so the solution was that a lot of um, preferably Protestant-speaking immigrants, uh, no, no, Protestant uh, immigrants from other countries like France, um, to fill up um, the gap. But also um, around the time, um, we saw uh, the beginning of coal mining in, in Germany, also in, in, in my regions. We have uh, several small coal mines here. We are in, um, uh, part of one of three large um, lignite deposits in Germany. There is the one at the Rhine River, the one at the um, Elbe River in, in the east of Germany, and we are like in the um, central German um, lignite deposit here, um, although we are probably the most western extent of the central German lignite deposit, um, region of uh, Kassel. So there were um, several smaller lignite mines and pits here, and they didn't last as long because they were small. They quickly grew uneconomical in the aftermath of World War II. Um, the last, where, where I'm from, closed in, in, 20, in 1970, and the last in the, um, uh, in the region of uh, Kassel closed in 1980 when the Borken coal plant closed. Also interesting, Borken was supposed to be replaced by a nuclear plant, uh, but never happened, sadly. And there are, but the most biggest are the lignite deposits in the very uh, west of Germany, at the Rhine River, and also at the Elbe River in Saxony. So the um, uh, lignite deposits close to the Rhine River, they are um, pretty um, similar in distance to the bituminous coal. Deposits at the Ruhr River, which um, is a tributary river of the Rhine. So uh, Ruhr is probably pretty famous. Um, it's where the heart of German industrialization um, happened in the uh, 19th century. Keep in mind that Germany is a rather decentralized and polycentric uh, country. So it's not, when we talk about the Ruhr being the heart of German industrialization, it's not like there is all of German industry but there was a lot of German industry. There were other centers of German industry, and there was also a lot of German industry spread out. So don't think of Germany as a country where um, a lot of stuff is centrally located. A lot of stuff in Germany is spread out and polycentric. It, this is the general theme of Germany. Um, um, but in the world, were basically our largest deposits of bituminous coal, uh, black coal, hard coal. Um, However, um, we had a lot of bituminous coal. We didn't have a lot of anthracite coal. Anthracite is this really high-quality coal that you find in England and Pennsylvania, which allows you to build like really high-powered um, uh, heaters for, uh, for boilers, for ships and locomotives. And the bituminous coal that we, will fi that we find in the world is um, bituminous coal that's of a rather poor quality. So in World War Two, when Germany was cut off, not World War II, World War One, Germany was cut off from importing anthracite coal from England, and we had to build, had to run um, the high power density boilers for warships with the crappy bituminous coal from the rural area. The um, slag buildup in the boilers clogged up the engines and ruined the engines. So um, when the in the high seas fleet. Um, uh, rode out um, to meet the, the British fleet at the famous Battle of Jutland. Um, after the battle um, was over, basically all the warships limped back into port at half power because uh, boilers were so clogged up from the slag in there that they couldn't properly run, they couldn't breathe the engines. And the high-quality anthracite coal that the British were burning because there's so little ash in it, it doesn't 
produce a lot of slag. So the bur boilers are, are much cleaner and don't get clogged up as, as easily. So this is a general theme. German coal is not the best coal, but we have a lot of it. This, this theme is fascinating because, you know, Germany, I guess, coming late to the scene in terms of nationhood um, and essentially missing the boat on colonization um, really had to depend on its own natural resources or, you know, be at risk of, you know, the much more powerful British Navy uh, blockading them from vital things like, you know, Peruvian guano or Chilean nitrates for, you know, fertilizer. They didn't have colonies that could that could feed Germany um, from outside, uh, but also for, you know, gunpowder. And then again, um, as I understand, uh, in the interwar period in World War II, um, the production of synth fuels from coal because of a lack of, of petroleum resources. Um, and there's even the idea, I believe, that God, is it World War One or World War II? Was, I think World War One was started because Germany was trying to form an alliance with uh, Turkey in order to get at its petroleum reserves. So Germany's constantly been frustrated, I think, in terms of its ambitions by a lack of uh, indigenous resources and been you know, incredibly inventive and ingenious in making up for those, whether it's with you know, Fritz Haber uh, and Karl Bosch uh, you know, creating the world's first uh, Haber-Bosch uh, uh, nitrate plants or or uh with with you know synth fuels or other 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 means of sort of it reminds me of the french like we do not have ideas or so we do not have oil but we have ideas the germans have done something similar on a number of occasions with a number of critical inputs for modern civilization but i have to interject there germany did have colonies i mean we were really late we didn't got a lot of it we got like all of the shame of having colonies and brutalizing <laughs> people there but none of the actual benefit like there was never a lot of money gotten out of it. It was not like, like the British people who like uh, genocided a, a bunch of people in their colonies, but at least they got a mon monetary benefit. We committed crimes in Namibia and Tanzania, but we didn't have any benefit. So all of the shame, none of the reward. Um, so German, German, um, German colonialism was like doubly embarrassing in that, in that, in that sense. Um, but, but yes, Germany, especially when it found itself um, um, during war, was like cut off um, through the sea in the um, 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 in the Franco-German War in, in 1870. The French Navy blockaded uh, the German coast in World War One. The British Navy blockaded the German coast, and um, similarly um, in in World War Two, Germany um, was cut off from international trade. And we had to do a lot of stuff ourselves, and that always involved mining um, a lot of coal, and also um, being creative in, in using that coal. So, uh, but but also this shifted the coal that we were using um, more from the bituminous coal to the lignite coal. So, as I said, the bituminous coal Germany had wasn't as good as like the anthracite coal that England had. But it was still like half decent coal. So when we lost World War I, this is basically what we paid our reparations in. It was what we could have sold. So not, not just that we sold coal for money, like there are provisions in the peace deal Hungary we signed after World War I, and there are um, like laws there regarding that uh, Czechoslovakia um, has to allow Hungary to import coal from Germany. Um, so we did that. We exported coal um, for money, to have money to pay reparations and debt. But we also just um, paid reparations straight in coal. And when we failed to make due on that, uh, the French army marched in and occupied the rural area where the um, bituminous coal was mined. And this, even though we had bituminous coal, made um, bituminous coal um, stairs for Germans itself. Because we needed to sell it and we needed to pay reparations with it. So um, after World War I, we see this increase in lignite mining. Um, lignite is um, significantly inferior to bituminous coal, but it's cheap. Um, we have a lot of it and um, uh, the other countries don't want it, so it, we can use it for ourselves. So lignite mining rose dramatically. Um, in the aftermath of World War I in, in the Weimar Republic. Um, so for, for reasons to achieve economic and energy autarky in order to have, have more energy and because it was cheap. Also um, improvements in excavator technology um, made lignite mining a lot more economically viable. 
So since lignite is so low in energy density, raw lignite, not refined lignite, it doesn't really make sense to mine it conventionally like in an underground mine. Attempts to do that were made, especially in, in decentralized mines um, producing coal for their near town or village, like in my region um, where lignite was mined underground. But um, what was far more economical was to do this big open pit mines. And as we built like ever increasingly large mechanical excavators powered by steam, then powered by electricity and diesel engines, um, this, it allowed us to, did real, to build uh, huge open pit uh, mines to extract the often meters to double digit meters thick layers of lignite that lay um, 20, 50, 60, 70 meters below the surface. So this made lignite really viable, really cheap, and this drove um, an increase in, in lignite use in Germany, huge in, in Germany. At the same time, technologies um, to refine lignite were developed. So lignite was used for electricity, where it mattered less whether you used um, uh, bituminous or lignite coal, just the matter that lignite doesn't really make sense to transport it because it's so low on energy density, so you always burn it where you get it. But what um, was also increasingly used was refining the lignite, turning the lignite, um, raw lignite, into lignite briquettes, basically washing it and drying it and pressing it so that you take the really crumbly, um, pure lignite, which has like an energy density of 8 megajoules per kilogram to those refined briquettes, chlorine in at 20 megajoules per kilogram. So you take something which is like... Um, dirt and turn it into something that is superior to wood in energy density. So this was one step of purification. Um, another step was turning the lignite into grudel quartz, which is a uh, coke, but it couldn't be used for metallurgical processes, but it could be used for home heating or for process heat in small boilers in, in smaller companies to get industrial heat. And then we started turning it into um, refined fuels. Since we lacked all, not just um, good quality coal, but also oil, um, turning the um, lignite coal into synthetic fuels um, was um, developed. And it started in the Weimar Republic and then um, increasingly got um, more common in, in Nazi Germany to turn uh, the lignite, basically the lowest quality of fuel that we have, into refined diesel and um, gasoline and kerosene and paraffin, and later even synthetic butter. What? So you, the Germans ate lignite? Um, Is that what you're saying? It was first, um, it, it was, for, I mean, it's not really synthetic, but it's more synthetic margarine, and um, it was first served to um, people living in concentration camps. Oh, my God. And then um, it was, as, as the war situation deteriorated, it was also served um, to the German uh, general public, as like uh, there was uh, a scarcity of um, cooking and eating oils in Germany at that time, wow. the, as in the, from the beginning of the war. Um, so at first, just the, the prisoners got it, and then everybody got uh, the synthetic margarine made from lignite. Okay, every episode has to have like a weird and zany fact, uh, something esoteric, and that one I think takes takes the cake. Um, when when talking particularly about this, you know, close relationship that you know, modern Germany anyway has had with lignite. That's that's fascinating. I always like to get these sort of vivid verbal descriptions of big pieces of infrastructure or a mining process. So we've kind of flirted around with this a, a bit already in this episode, but you mentioned these larger and larger excavators. And I just, if you can give us a description, A, of what they look like, B, what they're powered by, I understand they're kind of got a big electric cable coming to them, and C, and how you're taking the coal back from these huge, you know, I think it's like seven tons per shovel on this big rotating wheel. How you get all that coal back to the nearby coal plant, I think. Well, you, you tell me. I think the first really big excavators were like buckets on a chain that was dragged over um, the angled banks of the mines. Um, those were the first ones basically like 12, 20 meters high in, in the early uh, 2000s, in the early 20th century. And later, we got the bucket wheel excavators, and they grew progressively larger. So they were in the 10 to 20 meter range around 1900. 
And now they are 250 meters tall, the biggest ones. We had several tries mining lignite underground. Um, the most successful attempt was uh, the Meurostein, a big underground lignite mine. And during World War II, we tried to um, mine uh, lignite underground, 400 meter uh, deep lignite deposits that were 70 meters thick. So this is um, the thickness of those really big lignite deposits, 70 meters of pure coal. I mean, it's trapped coal, but 70 meters. So I think this kind of answers the question, why does Germany build those big machines to dig up this crappy coal? Because there's a lot of it on, a, of, on one place, like 70 meters um, on some areas, but also 12, 20 on, on others. So... Um, attempts at going like really deep, um, 400 meters deep to the uh, lignite underground um, were um, abandoned after World War II. And what we then um, did was um, go into overdrive of, of building these open pit mines increasingly bigger. Increasingly bigger allows us also to grow increasingly deeper because um, there's a limit to how deep you can grow depending on how big the mine is. A small mine can't get as deep so this also was happened in the in the late 90s when we started in in the, in the west of germany to um put like several of the smaller pits together into one it's also where the gartsweiler pit which is uh, the one that has been currently in the news came from it started out as at several smaller pits and then those grew together and in uh, in 2000 um there was the town of gartsweiler in the middle of it and also a highway and then they tore down the town and the highway and um, unified all those smaller pits into a bigger one. And that became Gartsweiler and it got named after this town, um, which doesn't exist for like now 20 years. And um, when they did this, they also built those um, 200, over 200 meters tall um, bucket wheel excavators. So this is basically the, the pinnacle of um, lignite mining technology. Um, it won't grow bigger or deeper than this. Not just not because we can't, but because we won't. So this is a dying industry. It's just a question of how long will it take to die and how much environmental damage will be done until um, we can let it die. Because um, West Germany had alternatives to lignite, to, uh, lignite coal. West Germany had two um, big regions to mine bituminous coal. Um, the Ruhr and the Saarland, and um, West Germany was prosperous and had access to international oil markets. West Germany quickly developed a nuclear sector, and West Germany imported, uh, really started importing natural gas from Norway and the Netherlands. And East Germany did not have those um, opportunities. In the 50s and 60s, East Germany started importing a lot of oil and gas from the Soviet Union as a kind of friendship among brother countries. But as the Soviets found out that the, their own prosperity soon depended on selling um, that gas and oil to the international market, um, they quickly also started limiting the selling of um, subsidized oil to their brother countries to basically the legal minimum. So um, East Germany quickly um, lost uh, the chance to import oil. So it was the amount of oil to limit from the Soviet Union, limited, and international oil it couldn't buy because it didn't have the money. So East Germany started to rely ever more on lignite, which was the only thing that East Germany really had. It had no gas, it had no oil itself, a minuscule amount, but it also had no bituminous coal. So East Germany had to rely on lignite from its inception, but the more severe its economy got in the um, 50s, what this basically meant, they had to run steam engines on lignite. And running steam engines on lignite, you get the same effect that I said the, the German Navy got. It clogs up the, um, uh, the grades of the engine. So they had a lot of pl problem with the wear and tear of those steam locomotives because they run, ran them with low quality fuel. And when they started, um, a big advantage was electrification of, of rail lines, since they could turn lignite into electricity, 
but they also were severely um, late to the electrification of rail line. Um, so what they tried to, again, was to turn lignite into synthetic fuels and also synthetic gas. So what, what they did even more than making synthetic fuels for the Trabants and their um, diesel locomotives was turning lignite into methane. So they built methanation plant and turned lignite into um, methane, which they burned in uh, natural gas peter plants, in gas boilers, and in uh, the chemical industry. Um, also, the purification of all this lignite left them with a lot of lignite tar. And they turned that lignite tar into roads, so in, in the um, asphalt for the, for the roads, but they also turned that lignite tar into um, cars. So um, my car, so the, I don't know what the English word, the carrosserie, the, the outer body of the car is made from steel. Some cars are made from aluminum, some cars are made from fancy carbon fiber. Um, East Germany had none of those, so they made cars basically from uh, lignite tar. The, the bodywork of the car was uh, made from lignite tar held together by um, cotton scraps imported from the Soviet Union. <laughs> That's the reason why, why, why East German cars are not safe against lightning. If wow. You, if you, in, a, in a normal car, it's made from steel, um, lightning strikes, it doesn't care. <laughs> in an East German car, <laughs> no. if it's struck by lightning, it, 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 um, it starts burning because it's made from like lignite resin. Also East, also, East Germany is the only place in the world which ever tried turning lignite into synthetic metallurgical coal. And this would be similar to the lignite brick process, compressing it. No, far it. more far more advanced because you have to get all the slag, all the ash, all the dirt out of it. So when you make the lignite bricks, um, it's, it's still like, it still contains all the ash. It burns, it leaves a lot of ash residue. But you can't have that in your in your synthetic metal. So they built like this elaborate process where um, where they uh, turned the um, where they turned the the lignite into smoke and then captured and condensed the smoke and compressed the condensed and captured smoke into um, a coke to make effectively synthetic metal. Only country that ever did this. German ingenuity at its finest. This is. <laughs> This is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's only made economical sense in a country that can't import anything. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, East Germany had really dependent on lignite. In, in, in the end, 70% of, en of their primary energy was lignite. Um, compared that to West Germany, um, only 9% was, uh, of West Germany's primary energy was lignite in, 20, in 1990. 14% per, of West Germany's primary energy was nuclear. So in, in West Germany, nuclear was like 60% larger than, uh, than lignite um, at the end of West Germany, at the end of East Germany for reunification. Lignite was like 70% of, of, of all East German um, primary energy. Your tales of kind of East German woe and dependence upon this very you know, poor energy source make me a little bit more compassionate to the enthusiasm in reunified Germany for Russian natural gas. The story makes a lot more sense now. And, and, but yet Germany finds itself once again in a situation where it's vulnerable to you know, foreign supplies, whether that was nitrates, whether that was petroleum, whether that was anthracite coal, and now with Russian gas. I mean, the story just echoes and reverberates through German history. Um, now that we are, uh, now we are no longer dependent on Russian gas, but we have other dependencies that we gained from this. Wow. Fascinating. Fascinating. And I mean, do, do you think that plays into, I mean, it's obviously played into German history and German geopolitics and, and, you know, the wars that Germany has engaged in, because I think to some people, you know, looking back, some of the expansionism, you know, does, doesn't make sense. And, you know, through the energy lens and, and being a, you know, someone who, who, you know, is now seeing the world almost entirely through an energy lens, maybe to my own uh, faults. Um, it, it, it's making more sense. This whole story is, is coming together. So um, Pates on history is essentially that um, energy determinism. Germany could have never won World War II due to a lack of uh, oil. 
Like World War One is a different story because the importance of oil was lower back then. But in in World War Two was um, um, the first kind of partially mechanized conflict. Um, everything started to run in on oil. That wasn't stationary. Everything that was mobile ran on oil. Mm. Everything stationary ran, still ran on coal. So, so there's no blitzkrieg um, with leg night. <laughs> yeah, that that was that was what they tried. Um, but um, they they couldn't even even though they they turned like a lot of late night into into oil and, and they did this increasingly desperate and increasingly small batch productions. Like at the end, they had like like dozens to hundreds of tiny um, synth fuel plants all over the country making synth fuel from locally sourced late night because all the big plants that like bombed into shit by the um, Royal and American Air Force. Unreal. Well, we got to leave it somewhere. Um, so I think we'll leave it here. Uh, but again, thank you, Noah. Um, so very illuminating. Long. Very illuminating. No, this was, this was intended to be a short, but you once again brought uh, so much quality content uh, to the table that I think it, it justifies it. So um, until we meet again, um, Noah, thanks again for, for coming on. And I think we'll be following up on the uh, upcoming protests um, and the story of hopefully the saving of uh, these remaining three nuclear plants in Germany. We're on a roll. Diablo Canyon, Pickering. Let's uh, let's save some more nuke plants. Wouldn't he bleibt? Okay, my friend. We'll talk soon.